in Fratelli Tutti, Francis first claims that Christian thinkers understood that, quote, if one person lacks what is necessary to live with dignity, it is because another person is detaining it, end quote. So, in other words, he's functioning on what's called the zero-sum game. There's only so much stuff, and if someone doesn't have enough stuff, it's because somebody else has too much stuff. He has criticized top-down economic, trickle-down economics. He does not believe uh, that, and, and simply won't recognize that historically, what has relieved poverty has never been Marxism. It's never been liberation theology. It's never been socialism. Socialism just makes everyone equally poor. What has relieved so much of the world's poverty has been the expansion of the economy through capitalism. Expansion. So if there's not enough of the pie, you bake a bigger pie. He is functioning on the idea that there's, there's only one pie and it's only so big. And so you need to get a smaller piece of the pie so somebody else can have a bigger piece of the pie. Now, that obviously is working in most of our universities now, too. Um, but it's been proven to be untrue around the world. That's what the last century showed us. But this is what Francis is promoting now as the Bishop of Rome. Now, my Roman Catholic friends, look, I understand why you do not want to hear from me that the Bishop of Rome is wildly out of step with his predecessors, with the history of the Roman Catholic Church, and that he is deeply influenced by fundamentally anti-Christian worldviews. You don't want to hear that from me. I've been debating you folks for decades, and so that may make it hard for you to accept the reality from me. But it was a couple years ago that I listened to this lengthy um, YouTube video from some, at least one guy who used to be associated with Catholic Answers, isn't it any longer? Uh, and it was, uh, some, the title was something along like, uh, Taking the Red Pill About Pope Francis, or Red Pilling Pope Francis, or something like that. And it's, of course, taken from the Matrix. You, you take the blue pill, you stay in the Matrix, you take the red pill, and you're disconnected from the Matrix, and you start seeing what's really going on. And so taking the red pill is transitioning from the dream world to the real world. And y'all need to take the red pill, okay? More and more, y'all are doing it. You're just being forced to do it, to realize, okay, yeah, you know what? It's really obvious. Um, John Paul II would not write Fratelli Tutti. And he fought against communism. And I can, I can just say these are all personal views of a pope until the cows come home. But the reality is, he is assigning people to the Papal Biblical Commission and all the other Papal Commissions that write all of the documents and decide who's teaching where and who's going to be in what office all across the world based upon his personal beliefs which would have gotten him burned at the stake under his predecessors. Not under Ratzinger or something like that, not under Benedict. But I mean, when you could still burn people at the stake, go, go back as far as you want to go to the last execution by burning at the stake that Rome was responsible for, whenever that is. It's not that long ago. Um, Francis would have been burned at the stake. He would have been burned at the stake. There's no question about it. Saying the things he said, not just about natural uh, property rights and natural law and everything else, but what he said about atheism, homosexuality, um, 
you know, uh, all these things, he would have been burned at the stake. So you have to deal with what that means. And invoking some kind of development hypothesis is not enough. There has been, there is a fundamental epistemological contradiction between saying that one man is the infallible vicar of Christ and another man is also infallible vicar of Christ, but the one would have burned the other. There, there's, there's a problem here. You can, you can spin it, you can stand on your head, you can hold your breath, you can do whatever you want. You have a problem with the authority claims of your church. You put all of your eggs in one basket after the Council of Constance, when for a moment conciliarism looked like it might get someplace, the Pope crushed it. And once Newman collapsed and Vatican I takes place, you're stuck with this. There's no way out of it for you. And you're stuck with Francis and what Francis's teachings mean. And so your own church is teaching in its, uh, what's, what's, he, what's he been doing with the universal Catholic, Catholic, Catholic? He changed that for what? To get rid of any possibility of capital punishment being a valid action of a government. Any. That goes against, <laughs> we were just saying, Go back to the last time that the Roman Catholic Church executed someone by burning them at the stake. Uh, now we have the Pope saying, there's never a time when that's appropriate. Okay. What does that tell you? Uh, that tells you there's been a fundamental change, hasn't there? Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed, there has. Now, so <clears throat> this is in a papal document. And this provides, I think, an important context for what then came out with the statements in a, a film called Francesco. And in, according to reports, on Wednesday, this documentary premiered in Rome. And according to the translation, he said... Quote, homosexuals have a right to be a part of the family. They're children of God and have a right to a family. Nobody should be thrown out or be made miserable because of it. Then it says, after these remarks and in comments likely to spark controversy among Catholics, Pope Francis weighed in directly on the issue of civil unions for same-sex couples, quote, what we have to create is a civil union law. That way they are legally covered, the Pope said. I stood up for that. Now, when it says, I stood up for that, that tells me he's talking about something from the past. And I'll be really interested to know exactly what something from the past that was in reference to. So, however you look at this, the... Um, the makers of the film found a good way for people to want to watch it. <laughs> if there's a rental fee or something, uh, more than one of us are going to be taking the time to, uh, to look at it. Because we know that historically, the Roman Catholic Church has identified homosexuality as a sin. Obviously, up until the past 60 years or so, it was, there wasn't any nuance in that. It wasn't just a uh, disordered desire, a, a state of disordered sexual desire. Uh, it was a sin that would preclude you from the kingdom of heaven. It was uh, clearly a mortal sin. Now, there is a long long history. We can go back to the Lollards. The Lollards had songs about the homosexual corruption of the Roman priesthood, and that was in the 1300s. So Rome's, 
Rome's history with homosexuality, a self-inflicted history, when you ignore what Scripture says, do not forbid marriage, um, there you go. Um, and I know, I know what the answers are. I debated Paco on it. I know what the answers are. Well, I'm married to the church. Well, that's, that's not what he was, that's not what Paul was talking about. And again, you can close your eyes to the reality of what has brought this about all you want. It doesn't change the truth. But at least Rome's morality and ethics on the subject have remained primarily unchanged for a long, long time despite her practice in the highest, highest corridors of the Vatican, highest corridors of the Vatican. But now you have this, and it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. The liberation theologians in South America who are applauding Francis for saying that private property ownership is a secondary right um, they're all on the LGBTQIRSTUV bandwagon. So this makes perfect sense. And once you've adopted the worldview that Francis has been giving evidence of for a long time now, oh, little boy, your atheist father died, but he had you baptized. Therefore, he went to heaven. Once you've got that kind of expression, who am I to judge homosexuals? That was years ago. Once you've got that going on, you know where the guy actually stands. The, the only question is going to be, will his personal views get expressed formally? That's the only question. And if in a documentary the Pope actually says that he stood up for creating a civil union law. We all know how that worked. Remember? Well, maybe we all don't know how that worked. It must be getting dry. No apple cider today. Um, but it still tastes good. Uh, cold water is a, a wonderful thing. <clears throat> Find, find, find a way to hide it so he can't sit on it to say something. He doesn't really have to sit on it. That's, uh, that's the problem. That's the problem. Um, remember, some of you aren't old enough to remember this, but before Obergefell and before the push for that, this civil unions thing was quite possible. That, that was the first step. Okay, we're not talking marriage. Okay, marriage, yeah, it's a man and woman. That's, you know, that's what him, humankind's always said. We're, you know, we're not talking about that, but, yeah, you know, um, how about something that would, you know, allow for property to be shared and, you know, it would give some of the benefits of marriage. We, won't, we don't want to call it marriage. And so that's what the Pope's talking about. We, we, we don't want to call it marriage. Well, why don't you want to call it marriage? Well... Because within Roman Catholicism, that, that's a sacramental thing. And, and yeah, that'd be really hard to just come straight out and Obergefell the Roman Catholic Church. Could Francis do that? Of course he could. That's the, that's the, that's the problem with the system. And the faithful Roman Catholic says he could, but he can't, because God will strike him dead first. <laughs> because it's so obvious. The problem is... If you have Francis now, who's the next guy? And the next guy is going to come from a cardinal, a college of cardinals that's been packed in the traditional historical sense of packed by Francis. Okay? So I know that there was a day when Boston College taught historical, traditional Roman Catholic beliefs. Boston College doesn't today. You think that happened overnight? No, it happened over decades, over a century. Has, they had time to do it. And that's what you're seeing in the papacy. And the result is that what is taught at Boston College today is basically 
a 180 degree opposite mirror of what was taught there not overly long ago. So you can, again, to my Roman Catholic friends, you can say, it's just a documentary. It's just a private opinion. It's just, he's just talking about civil unions. But you know in your heart of hearts, this is how it's done. This is how the, how the revolution is accomplished. No, this is not a binding statement. You can't say that the Pope has infallibly said that civil unions are the law of the church. He hasn't yet. Could never happen. Really? I would think 2020 has taught most of us to avoid making the statement, it could never happen. <laughs> because <clears throat> in, in January of this year, if you had told people the things we have voluntarily submitted ourselves to, uh, we would have said, no, no way. The, the citizens, I was in Melbourne last year. And if you, as, as we sat there, we had fish and chips at this wonderful place on the, on the beach, really good fish and chips. And if you had told me then that within a year, the citizens of that city could not move more than 5,000 meters from their homes and only when wearing masks, even going that far. I was said, what, what, what black helicopter theory are you talking about? But that's the way it is right now, right now as we speak. So let's, let's not do the, uh, it could never happen. Uh, it could. The system has no way of stopping it. And remember, I've told you many times before, years and years ago, I pointed out a stark contrast between the statement of John Paul II and that of one of his predecessors long before, one well, of the innocents, I think it was Innocent III or 10th or something like that, where they said the exact opposite things about the same subject. And a Roman Catholic apologist, Robertson Genis, responded by saying, James, you have no right to interpret the teachings of the church. Only the church can interpret her own teachings infallibly. So what if Francis's successor does say that civil union laws are just and righteous? Because that's what Francis is saying, and that this is the law of the church. And that uh, homosexuals who enter into these civil unions will be accepted uh, to mass and will be members in good standing in the church. And you say, but that is against what we've taught. Who gets to interpret what has been taught? The guy making the rule. That's what your whole system's about. You can say, but, but the people back then didn't understand that. That's just your fallible reasoning. Submit to the Holy Father. You got no way out of it because you've created your entire epistemological system. You're the ones that sat around saying, you can't have a canon of scripture without us defining it. You can't have scripture without us defining it. And I've been trying to tell you for decades, you believe in sola ecclesia. And the more you fight it, the more you prove it. And you say, no, we have a <clears throat> tripartite system. No, you don't. I've pointed out before, what is scripture? Rome tells you. What does scripture mean? Rome tells you. What's tradition? Rome tells you. What does tradition mean? Rome tells you. You can't be corrected by scripture and tradition in that situation. And so if the Pope says it, you're stuck with it. I've been seeing people all over the place. <clears throat> that, that, that can never happen. They, they'd remove him. What do you mean they'd remove him? There's, there's no system in place to do that. What are you doing? <clears throat> It just occurred to me when you said that, it's, okay, so the predecessor says this is the law and then does the development thing, and it always has been. Right. He just does, they shoehorn it right back into history, yep. and next thing you know, we're going to find some early father that used some language that was a little bit off the beaten path and go, see, we've always believed it. It's always been the doctrine of that the church. That is how Rome interprets the early fathers, all the fathers, on everything. Look, you can't complain. 
you people have been ransacking the Bible looking for anything about Mary that you want to read into. You can't complain if they t treat dealer church fathers the same way and find some wacky thing to say, ah, there it is. You got no way around it. You have your ultimate authority. It's unreformable because you bowed in the 1870s to Vatican I, which said the Pope's infallible. You're stuck with it. That's all there is to it. It's a circular, broken epistemology, and you're watching the wheels. Right now, you ever watch one of those situations on a, somebody's on their car? And it comes off, and, and that's, that's where you are. Artie Johnson on the tricycle. I was a Christian. I didn't. I. I, I didn't. I didn't watch that back then. No, I remember laughing, but 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 we weren't really allowed to watch that. No, no, we weren't allowed to watch that. No. So, but I do. I do know what you're talking about. I know you're a pagan, so that's all right. That that's okay. I have to. I have to deny that I have any knowledge of that. Anyway. So, so. So yeah, so I've, so there's all these people. Uh, I, I mean, it is sort of funny to watch Protestants dealing with the Pope and not knowing, not recognizing the difference between a, a documentary and infallible statement, or um, you know, saying, "Oh, the Pope has come out and he's now approved this or approved." No, he he did a documentary where he said that homosexuals should be able to have civil unions so that they can, they can have a family. Now, that's problematic, but it's not an official definition. That should be enough to make any Roman Catholic go, this pope is absolutely compromised. Worldview, theology, everything. I mean... I can't imagine what it's like to be a believing Roman Catholic right now. There's this guy, what was it, Delaney was his, that was his name? On Twitter. Obviously intelligent fellow, but the, the depth he was having to go to, to spin everything that is so obvious about Francis, it's just, it's, it's prostitution of the mind. It really is. You've got to take the red pill and go, this guy's off. I mean, at least some of you are finally going, you know what? We've had some, we've had some anti-popes in the past. And we're in a situation where we have an anti-pope. That, 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 that would make sense because there's all sorts of times. Uh, read J.D. Kelly's History of the Popes. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of times when you've had popes that, History has basically said, yeah, not really. <laughs> I mean, that sort of gives the lie to the unbroken succession thing, too. But the point is, there's, aside from the Babylonian captivity of the church, where you had three popes, up to three popes, for, for decades you had two popes, busily anathematizing the other pope. Nobody knew which one was the right one. And then eventually you had three popes, and then the Council of Constance came along, fixed all that, and you moved on from there and burned Yan Hus for the fun of it. Anyway, uh, th this idea of anti-popes is not unknown at all, and I would imagine there's probably a number of people that are going, yeah, I think it's time to go back to that. They don't like the instability that creates. It's one thing to talk about it 800 years ago. It's another thing to talk about right now, because that makes it very practically impossible for you to be doing a lot of the apologetics you normally do. Um, yeah, that... <sighs> That last convocation, uh, evidently the Holy Spirit wasn't able to get everybody to vote for the right guy. And so here we have the problem. Maybe they can just blame it on, uh, hey, you know, I hadn't even thought about it, but some of you might just be sitting there going, this guy's, not, this guy's the anti-pope because Benedict's still alive. Oh. Benedict's not dead. And I can guarantee you, if Benedict is still functional, he's spitting spitting his teeth out uh, at this kind of stuff. Oh. <laughs> but no, you could, you could make the argument that that's, that's, how you, that's how you rescue it, is you, you make the argument that Benedict is still the current proper pope. Francis is an anti-pope. And whoever comes in next heals the schism or something. I, I don't know. Hey, 
Rome has done weirder things uh, than 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 this. But I'm looking forward to the documentary. It's going to be interesting. There's probably some other stuff in there. Um, but what we're what we're looking at here is not an official declaration, but it is a clear documentation of the fact that the current pope would be toasted by most of his predecessors. Yeah, not not just the extra dark toast. We're we're, we're talking fry baby toast um, by his predecessors. That's a fact, and you have to think through what that means. Now, if you want to continue believing in him, you'll find a way to do it. That's that's what Twitter has proven. That's what Twitter has proven is you'll you'll find a way to do it. It's sad, but it's true. But it's true.